it is written, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Acts 20, 26 through 27. Hello and welcome to the first video in our series, A Whole Bible, based on chapter 6 of our book, Whole Bible Christianity. I'm Bruce Bertram. In this series, we're going to do like Jesus did and look at the rabbi's teachings. We're going to compare his corrections of their teachings to current church interpretations of the word and their traditions. We'll also look at the apostles' teachings and, like Jesus, compare current teachings on the word with what is written. As we'll see, the corrections of Jesus have been corrected by the church in much the same way the rabbis corrected God in his law. That is, the corrections by Jesus and the apostle used the whole Bible the way God intended. But sadly, the church by and large does not. We've done a de decent job teaching about Jesus in some ways, but like the rabbis, we've also added a bunch of wrong interpretation and tradition in our zeal to follow him. Jesus didn't just waltz into the Jewish community and tell them everything they believed in and were doing was wrong. He never said God's law was wrong, old, eliminated, or outdated. That's the impression we get if we listen to most church teaching. If he had tried something like that, he would have been rejected immediately on good grounds, instead of later with no grounds. Israel had been spanked repeatedly by New Testament times precisely because they weren't following God's word as they should. They had learned the hard way that they should follow only and exactly what God said, except they didn't learn the lesson quite as completely as God intended. They had finally learned that God was the only God to be worshipped, but in their zeal to obey only him, they had twisted the life out of his living oracles. They developed a part Bible way of looking at the law. Their religious leaders had decided to help God out by interpretations of the law that added much that God didn't come in. They had also set aside other parts through tradition, all the while thinking they were still doing what God wanted. Some teachers read a conflict into the New Testament writings between law and grace. For instance, the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery John 8, is frequently presented as Jesus, grace, against the antiquated law, the accusers. Grace wins because Jesus tears up the arguments from the law. Now many people think that you can't judge me because everyone sins. On the contrary, the real conflict was between Jesus using the law with grace correctly against the mob who was not. Grace still wins because grace is a big part of God's law. Jesus taught continuity with the law, and the first century church lived it. There are lots of instances, but we'll just look at some of the biggies. Most of these have either been ignored or misinterpreted to remove the absolute objective as aspect of obedience. Remember, we can also think of this as abiding. But far from doing away with the law or changing it for an imaginary new church, Jesus and the apostles were preaching it, and the New Testament believers were learning it and living it. There are 27 books in the New Testament, but I challenge you to try and find even one instance in the entire package of a negative word about the law. There are warnings against misusing it. There are teachings pitting the law against petrified tradition and attractive but wrong interpretations. It is filled up full with God's love as it should have been all along. But never, never is there a bad thing said about God's law. In fact, the law is established, upheld, referred to, and applied to daily living. It could not be otherwise since the books are part of God's word. So let's take a fresh look at the use of the law in the New Testament. Matthew, in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of his gospel account, records for us the second Sermon on the Mount. Yep, I said second, because the first was at Mount Sinai with Moses, who relayed it to Israel. The second is similar to the first, even identical. Since Jesus actually gave both sermons, we would expect they would sound alike, alike which they do. 
In fact, what we really have here is Jesus cutting through man's false teachings about what he set down at Sinai. He repeats his message over and over and over and over in the Bible. Man's interpretations or applications of the law to that point were lacking, so Jesus corrected them. In 517, he says he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. The word abolish is clear. It means eliminate or destroy or change. As in, I did not come to eliminate the law. The word fulfill then obviously means something different. It wouldn't make very much sense for Jesus to say, I did not come to abolish the law, but to abolish it. It doesn't mean that he came to fulfill and then abolish it either. The word fulfill, used as the opposite of abolish, means to interpret correctly, so that words are given their proper meaning. It's clear in this context Jesus is saying he would not destroy the law through wrong interpretation. So we can read this statement as, I did not come to remove or destroy or change the law, but to correctly interpret it and put it back on a firm foundation. The word fulfill by itself also means to fill it full, as in filling up the foundation forms of a house with cement. The religious leaders had the framework, Moses' teachings, but had added empty interpretation and tradition. Jesus cements his intention by telling us that even the tiniest part of God's law will not change until heaven and earth pass away. Some try to make the phrase, until all is accomplished, to mean Jesus changed the law through the resurrection. But heaven and earth certainly did not pass away at that time. Therefore, the law still stands, placed on a firm foundation by the giver and interpreter. It is still absolutely applicable today. Jesus framed his Matthew teachings in terms of, you have heard thus and so, but I say to you, He's not saying that God's word said this and I'm changing it to this, not when he gave the law in the first place and when he just said he would not destroy it or change it. Instead, Jesus was saying, you have heard this other interpretation, limited to action, but I say that this is the correct interpretation, including motivation or the heart. The teachings Jesus gives in support of this include other parts of the word and real world examples. Remember, too, that behind all of his interpretations is the perfection of God, especially as expressed in the garden before the fall. In other words, the standard of comparison for sin is not just actions, it is the presence of anything not in line with God's love in the heart. Religious leaders had limited sin to actions alone, so as long as a person didn't do the action, then in their view they were sinless. Jesus plugs the heart back in, showing that no one is righteous apart from God, even in their heart. Psalm 14, 1 through 3, 53, 1 through 3, Romans 3, 10 through 18. What Jesus teaches in the second Sermon on the Mount is also scattered throughout the Old Testament. That is, if one were to look, compare, for instance, Isaiah 66 to the Sermon on the Mount or the second one. The law, for instance, is summarized as justice and righteousness, especially for widows and fatherless children in places such as Deuteronomy 10.18, 24.17, 27.19, 31.22, and 10.2, and Jeremiah 22.3. His teachings restore the wholeness of his word by putting back things taken out by Jewish leaders and nowadays church leaders. These things include motives, love, and the spirit, otherwise known as heart. Some of the real-world examples that Jesus properly interpreted concern murder, 5.21-26, adultery and divorce, 5.27-32, vows, 5.33-37, see also Deuteronomy 23.22 and 24, Malachi 2.16, and hating enemies, 5.43-48. Religious leaders had cut them out of context, robbed them of the Spirit, and sometimes just made things up. Jesus puts the law back into the love back into the law where it belongs and re emphasizes God's intentions. Anger, for instance, comes from pride. There is no love in pride. That's why it is similar to murder, because anger and hate are so far removed from God's love that murder is not far behind. God hates divorce because love is ignored. We should watch it that we don't pop off and make a vow because that's pride and God will hold us to it. 
And hating your enemy isn't even in the law. It's not that hard to see that Jesus isn't rewriting anything other than people's opinions about the word. Of the available ways of applying God's word, Jesus tells us that the most accurate is to include the thoughts which give birth to the action. The heart. Anyone that has ever raised children knows that we come out of the womb knowing how to sin. When we get to be adults, we are better at hiding it. Sin is a leaning or intent, and sins are the fruit of the leaning. Sometimes leaning comes out in overt action all at once, and sometimes it is hidden. Either way, we are still sinful. Lusting is the same as coveting, and Jesus says that it is adultery whether acted out or not. The point is that if all the laws are properly balanced, then the conclusion is a lot different than men's teachings to that point, or to this point. God's love includes a broad understanding and practice of God's word in all instances, even down to the roots of the actions. The heart of the matter, if you will, which takes us right back to the new covenant. The so-called golden rule is another example of the law fulfilled. This is plain to see if the real goal is to follow God's law through its engraving on our hearts of flesh. As it is written, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7, 12. This is part of both sermons on the mounts and fits in nicely with his other expanded te meanings. It is also another way of saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. John 15, 12 further modifies it with an old chestnut. Love one another as I have loved you. In this case, he is also dealing with motivations, but in a positive way. Instead of saying, don't do this or that, Jesus shifts the focus to the individual. Whatever way a person wants to be treated should be the rule for how they treat others. For more examples of this, see verses such as Exodus 12.49, Leviticus 24.22, and Numbers 15.15-16 15, 15 and 29. This rule makes it easy to follow the law and to apply God's word in any situation. Our examination of church teachings compared to the Bible will continue in the next video with a look at the testing of Jesus. Did he get rid of the law or did he reinforce it in his answers to his critics? If you want all this written out, you can read a draft of my book, Whole Bible Christianity, on our website, www.wholebible.com. Subscribe to our channel, please, or register on our blog to comment. Thanks for watching. Shalom.